listening. For those of you just joining us, uh, we're in the first morning uh, of what began last night of the 2011 Baylor Symposium on Faith and Culture, Educating for Wisdom in the 21st Century University. I'm Darren Davis. I'm a member of the philosophy faculty and also director of the Institute for Faith and Learning. I'm so pleased that you're here. The morning has begun well. Last night's talk by Candace Vogler was inspiring. I was uh, honored to be a, a, a audience member in a wonderful student-led panel by honor students from Oklahoma Baptist University who spoke about wisdom, what it was for them to be learners, um, and engagement of the most important questions that we can think about as human beings. It was a really delightful uh, presentation given by those honor students. Um, we have such a diverse group of presenters, um, and among those are uh, three persons who have led universities, leading them now and have led them. Um, and when we th thought about how to arrange this particular panel, uh, we thought about putting together uh, a group of uh, different Christian universities uh, and then some very able spokespersons to speak about this project of educating for wisdom in Christian universities. So we could not be more honored to have the three who are here join us. Let me introduce them now. Um, to my left and to your far right, Philip Graham Riken is the eighth president of Wheaton College, where he himself studied philosophy and English literature as an undergraduate. He earned a Master of Divinity degree from Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia and a doctorate in historical theology from the University of Oxford. Dr. Riken returned from England to join the pastoral staff at Philadelphia's 10th Presbyterian Church where he preached for 15 years before becoming president at Wheaton College in 2010. He has published more than 30 books, including The Message of Salvation, Riken's Bible Handbook, Art for God's Sake, and expository commentaries on Exodus, Ecclesiastes, Jeremiah, Luke, and other books of the Bible. His newest book is on King Solomon. In the middle, Father Robert J. Spitzer, who is the president of the Magis Center of Reason and Faith and the Spitzer Center for Catholic Organizations and also the Chief Educational Officer for the Ethics and Performance Institute. A priest in the Society of Jesus, he served as president of Gonzaga University from 1998 to 2009. An award-winning philosophy professor at Georgetown University, Seattle University, and Gonzaga. Father Spitzer is the author of five books, including Spirit of Leadership, Optimizing Creativity and Change in Organizations, New Proofs for the Existence of God, and Ten Universal Principles, A Brief Philosophy of the Life Issues. Finally, Kenneth Winston Starr, who is Louise L. Morrison Professor of Constitutional Law at Baylor Law School and the 14th President of Baylor University, a post he assumed also in 2010. A graduate of George Washington University, Brown University, and Duke University, where he earned his JD, Judge Starr has had a distinguished career in academia, law, and public service. As Solicitor General of the United States from 1989 to 1993, he argued 36 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. He's taught constitutional law at New York University School of Law, George Mason University School of Law, Chapman Law School, and Pepperdine Law School, where he held the position of Duane and Kelly Roberts Dean and Professor of Law. He's the author of more than 25 publications, including his book, First Among Equals, The Supreme Court in American Life. What we've decided to do is um, ask Dr. Riken to begin and offer a brief reflection on this question about educating for wisdom in Christian universities, followed by Judge Starr and then Father Spitzer. After their time of individual presentations, then we'll allow some time for them to have a conversation um, among you, but first among themselves, reflecting on each other's contributions 
and then we'll open it up to the floor for questions. Please join me in welcoming these three. Well, thank you. I'm certainly grateful for the generous invitation to participate in this symposium and, um, and privileged to be on this very distinguished panel. And I also admire, I say I admire Dr. Davis for the order that he's selected here and the wisdom of it. Um, I'm reminded of what I've read of uh, monastic practice in certain orders that when there were communal deliberations, uh, it was the youngest person who would speak first so as to be corrected by the wisdom of his elders. <laughs> so uh, you may get a, a living demonstration of that uh, this morning. <laughs> I, I want to begin at the beginning. Um, I think the, uh, the beginning for me personally in a, in a journey of the pursuit of wisdom, but, but also the absolute beginning for all of us. Uh, when I grew up, I attended the Wheaton Christian Grammar School which program in, in Christ-centered education. And the cornerstone of our building was drawn from Proverbs 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And uh, I was, I suppose, an unusual child in many ways, but I, I read that cornerstone as I walked past it day after day after day through years and years and years of elementary education, I, I would think about it sometimes. What, what does this mean? What does it mean to fear the Lord? Uh, it was obvious to me that this was something very important for my education because it was right there in the building. Um, and I had a sense that uh, this was important for, for all of my studies, that there was something here that I was supposed to grasp and, and it was important to to education and, and to life generally. And then eventually it was pointed out to me somewhere along the way in that educational process that there's a connection between that cornerstone and what the scripture says about Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. And uh, it became a discovery then that this foundation for wisdom and for knowledge uh, has a personal dimension to it and, and so even from my early days, I've, I've had a sense that wisdom is something that I should be pursuing as, as part of my education. And, and we wanna talk in this panel about how it is that wisdom not only begins in the Christian life, but also grows and is nurtured, and particularly how is that nurtured in the lives of college and university students. And I, I want to, as, as we, we start to explore that, um, I want to just emphasize a conviction that I have that what the Holy Spirit uses to produce wisdom is the Word of God. I think of uh, the way that the, the psalmist uh, celebrates the flourishing life as one planted by streams of living water, uh, or the way that Later on in the Psalms, it's, it's emphasized that God's word is a lamp to our feet and uh, a light to our path. This is what gives us guidance and direction for the wise way to live. And when I say that, I, I feel that immediately we have to recognize a problem in, in today's culture, and that is uh, a gradual erosion of biblical knowledge and little by little an increase in, in biblical illiteracy. Uh, nearly all of my longstanding faculty at Wheaton College would identify this as just an ongoing problem in cultivating, in cultivating wisdom um, in, in the Christian life, that students simply do not know their Bibles as well as they really need to know them to integrate learning with faith and um, to really make sense of a Christian, in our case, a Christian liberal arts uh, curriculum. Just a couple of anecdotal examples of that. I've heard uh, George Lindbeck comment that when he compares the beginning of his teaching career at Yale University to the end of his teaching career, a uh, period of what, three or four decades, something like that, a long career, Secular students knew more Bible when he started than church-going students know today. Um, he's just commenting on the place of the Bible in just standard or general education and, and the way that, that that has really been displaced in American culture. Here's another 
sort of anecdotal comment. I was talking to one of our uh, theologians at Wheaton, who's uh, relatively new, and he said, you know, when I, I began teaching here, I, I assumed that I could just refer or broadly allude to biblical content, and students immediately would be able internally to download that portion of scripture, that set of biblical narratives. But he said, now I find, at least for some of my students, I can't just refer to Joseph I have to say now there was this man Joseph and he had you know these brothers and just tell a little of the story uh, to make sure that students are able to enter into uh, that illusion. That's a, an illustration perhaps of, of uh, what we're up against. I would say now the common reference point for many students, um, even on a Christian campus and certainly on non-Christian campuses, it would be movies movie culture, uh, lines from movies, movies that everyone has seen. That's what you can allude to and people will immediately be able to download it. Um, and, and I suppose you can learn a certain kind of wisdom, at least from some films, but not without critical reflection and not without a strong biblical frame of reference for that kind of critical engagement. And you need that biblical content for every area of study and every area of life, and you particularly need it for uh, for wisdom. And so one of the things, and, and maybe this would be a discussion point for us, one of the things that we certainly need to cultivate on our college and university campuses is the knowledge of scripture and think how to do that programmatically, how to do that both inside and outside the curriculum. And I, I have further thoughts about that that perhaps we could share in discussion. But let me, let me problematize the situation further um, by saying that the challenge we face is greater. It's not simply um, a lack of knowledge of the Bible, but uh, sort of what we're not taking in, but it's also what we are taking in from the culture around us. And particularly in, in a digital age uh, in which we've moved from um, the dominance of the book to the dominance of the screen, and in which there are, of course, more or less wise and foolish ways of using information technology. I'm, I'm not going to present a sort of absolute uh, Luddite position this morning, but I, I do want to make the, the case that social media tend not to promote wisdom. There are, there are aspects of information technology and social media that inhibit that. And let me just mention a couple of them, um, and I'm sure there are people here that, that in a more sophisticated way could speak on these things, but you tend to get bits and pieces of data and information uh, rather than something that is complete and coherent in a line of thought. Uh, you tend to get input that is disembodied um, and therefore tending towards, I think, Gnosticism, a lack of life-on-life -life connection when communication is uh, technologically mediated and you have less face-to-face, -face, deliberate, leisurely conversation. And a lot of the, the way that we use information technology makes it hard to sustain focus and inhibits uh, practices of deeper, sustained reading and reflection. Uh, I have to say that I'm, I'm viewing college education this year, not only as a college president who has a kind of, I think, fatherly affection towards our students, but also more specifically as a father, because my son, my oldest son is a freshman at Wheaton this year. And he, one of his courses is Introduction to Philosophy. And uh, basically the whole semester is reading Plato's Republic and reading Augustine's Confessions. And uh, Mark Talbot, who's teaching the course, uh, said to the students at the beginning, I am going to teach you how to read a book. That's, that's what we're gonna do this semester. And as a, as a college president and also as a father, I was absolutely thrilled uh, with the methodology and the students really buy into it as well. They, they understand this is what I'm in college for and I'm getting something here in a way that I've, I've never had it before. But that's very contrary to the kind of media culture uh, we live in. The other thing you get with a lot of social media is the temptation to make glib comments and uh, to offer sarcastic comebacks. And it's not a communication style that's conducive to wisdom or always to a, a sympathetic and charitable um, 
taking on of somebody else's viewpoint so that you understand it to the point where you can really uh, engage it uh, thoughtfully. Um, there are just dynamics at work in, in information technology that inhibit the kind of communication and community that promote uh, wisdom. I've been uh, reflecting on, on what we have lost in uh, the, the communication of knowledge partly through a, um, an advanced seminar in faith and learning that I've been participating in this year. As president, I wanted to get in on one of these advanced seminars that we have. They're multidisciplinary, 10 to a dozen faculty members that get a course load reduction, spend the year working together on a theme, reading and discussing together. I, I intended to do this sometime, but then when I heard the topic this year, uh, Alan Jacobs from our English department is leading a seminar on Christianity and the book its past and its future, and I, I, I just said I, I can't miss that topic. It's too important for what's happening in education today. And one of the things we've been looking at recently is um, the uh, Didascalicon of Hugh of St. Victor writing in a monastic community about how reading should be done uh, in, in, a, in a Christian community, how monks should read sacred texts and also secular texts from the classical tradition in a way that's uh, promotional of, of Christian discipleship. And really, the whole approach is oriented towards wisdom for life. Uh, Hugh, Hugh talks about the way that a, a reader is one who has, to some extent, made himself an exile from worldly pursuits to concentrate his entire attention and desire on wisdom which then becomes for him the home that he is longing for. Uh, there's a, a pattern here of exile from the, word, from the world, finding a home in the life of the mind and the pursuit of wisdom. And, and what's striking, and it, it's, it's hard to read it, I think, without some sense of lament, is that here is a community in which there is no real divide between the sacred and the secular between studious reading and devotional reading, because all of it is, is really of a piece, and operating both within the classical uh, traditions of higher learning and within the Christian reformation of those traditions in which wisdom is identified with the person uh, of Jesus Christ, there's a unity or coherence to that pursuit of knowledge which ultimately is in, uh, in the pursuit of, of wisdom. And, and Hugh comments as well on um, the goal of education as the restoration of the divine image within us, which restoration comes both through the contemplation of truth and also the practice of virtue. So there's a practical orientation to the life of the mind. It's not simply this reading and this communal discussion, but it's also how that gets worked out uh, in daily life. I, I read those themes and I say, here are principles and practices that nourish the life of wisdom and which need to be re reintegrated uh, in the 21st century because there's such a divide between secular and sacred and often such a divide between classroom learning and the practice of wisdom uh, in daily life. And if I ask the question, how can we give our, our students this kind of experience and this is uh, maybe the last thing I, I want to emphasize between, uh, before turning things over to, to Judge Starr. Um, how do we cultivate this kind of experience? And I, I think there is absolutely no substitute for having a mentor and guide through the learning process and having an educational experience which is, is closely mentored and re related to the life of, of Christian uh, discipleship. We, uh, we do a fair amount of uh, talking on our campus about experiential learning, and it's been an educational process for me this year to realize that experiential learning is much more than simply having an experience. Uh, there's been widely publicized research coming out of Georgetown University about um, cross-cultural or overseas experiences that, that students have. And one of the major findings is that students are collecting experiences but not having a transformational experience that teaches them, for example, how to have cross-cultural competency. Uh, so they've had an experience, but they haven't had the kind of learning experience that you get when 
A mentor and guide prepares you for the experience that you're about to have, guides you through that experience, and then helps you reflect on that experience afterwards. Um, a, a mentored experiential learning. And I, I think that role of the mentor is uh, crucial biblically. I, I think of all the things that are said about wisdom in the, Saul, uh, in the Proverbs, and the way that, in, for example, at the beginning of, of Proverbs chapter 5, this wise guide says, be attentive to my wisdom. Uh, I am imparting something to you person to person, life on life. Uh, it's not wisdom in the abstract, but it's wisdom that, that has come through my own experience of life, which I, I now share with you uh, person to person. So there's, there's a lot of biblical resonance to this kind of mentorship or discipleship. But also, um, I think it's demonstrable the influence that this has. On, on the plane right here, I, I was reading a, a new book by David Horner, who teaches philosophy at Biola. Uh, it's a book called Mind Your Faith, and it's uh, a student's guide to, li to thinking and living well. It's really a, a spiritual survi survival guide uh, for college and university students. And he talks in there about the, what research has shown about students who sustain a life of faith after their college and university experience and the factors that go into that. I won't mention all of them, but one of the critical factors is having mentors who modeled the life of faith, who modeled the life of pursuing the Christian worldview, and that becomes critical to your experience as a disciple of Christ uh, after college or university. I, I've had just a, a recent example of that in that we have a program at Wheaton called Wheaton Passage, and for two weeks at the beginning of August, uh, we put about a third of our freshman class through an experience partly in Chicago for some of the students, but primarily in the northwards of Wisconsin, in which faculty members guide students through wilderness experiences and also a collection of, of readings on Christian worldview, uh, what it means to live in Christian community, and, and particularly, uh, the role of the spiritual disciplines in college and university life. And uh, I participated in leading one of those groups this year, recently had those young men over to our home for dinner and we were debriefing on the experience kind of at the end of this, two months into college. And uh, you know, one of the things they said was, you told us about some of the things we would go through. We have now gone through some of those things. You were absolutely right in what you told us. It didn't make it any easier, but we were able to make sense of it as we were going through it because we had been pre prepared for it. And now there's an opportunity for us to reflect on those experiences together. And um, I was deeply grateful to the Lord as I had this conversation with these students because even in the space of two months, it was evident they were already becoming the men that God intends for them to become. The quality of their discussion, their capacity for listening to and learning from one another, how they were talking about local church in, uh, involvement and their, their calling as Christians in the world, uh, it was well advanced from what it had been even two months ago. And I think it was this kind of rich, uh, communal, guided, mentored experience that was uh, contributing to it. So those are a few uh, reflections on, uh, on wisdom for students in the 21st century. Thank you, Phil. Well, let me uh, join Darren in welcoming uh, each uh, of you. Uh, it is a great privilege uh, and honor for Baylor University to be hosting this, and we love our wonderful uh, Institute for Faith and Learning, which Dr. Davis uh, heads up. So uh, let me uh, again extend, uh, even on the second day, a warm welcome to each and every one of you. It's uh, especially a delight to have not only uh, Baylor faculty and students uh, here, but to have my mentor, uh, I sat at his feet for six years. Uh, my provost, uh, I feel as if I still report to the provost, uh, <laughs> the chief academic officer. So I'm so glad that Daryl Tippins, the distinguished provost, chief academic officer of Pepperdine, uh, is here. I actually, as a dean, looked forward to those biweekly meetings. I have a feeling there are relatively few deans on precious few campuses <laughs> who look forward. <laughs> Uh, and I wanted to get the, the sort of the business of the day after, uh, out of the way so I could sit at his feet and hear about John Milton and the origins, uh, the Christian origins of, of, of freedom uh, in, in, in English uh, 
political thought. So, Daryl, I'm so delighted that, that, that you are here. And it's also great to be on this particular panel with two uh, very esteemed uh, colleagues. So, Phil, we're delighted to welcome you. We love Wheaton. Uh, we want more Wheaton graduates to come to graduate school uh, here uh, and to the Baylor Law School, so forgive that pitch. And then I'm so uh, crass commercialization, drive the money changers out of the temple. And uh, I am uh, truly uh, honored to sit at the feet of Father Spitzer. Uh, if you have heard him before, uh, you know what I'm s saying, you know whereof I speak. If you haven't, uh, get ready, fasten your seat belts. And so I would do well to say, and now here's Father Spitzer, because I have sat at his feet uh, before and my notes just can't keep up with all that Father Spitzer has to impart. So he honors us uh, by, by being here as well. It was uh, T.S. Eliot who uh, had some wise observations about uh, Christian higher education. And let me not paraphrase, let's go to the text. The purpose of Christian higher education would not be merely to make men and women pious Christians. Rather, a Christian education must primarily teach people to be able to think Ah, to think in Christian categories. Uh, and so I suggest that the role of Christian higher education, the Christian university, uh, is to help all of us, some of us hopefully are a little bit farther down uh, the road than our students, to think theologically, to mature as individuals spiritually, and to develop what uh, I call somewhat clumsily the habits of the mind that tend toward community building in humility, to be a builder of community, but in humility. And it begins appropriately uh, with the teachings of Jesus. Uh, and in particular, uh, the parable of the talents, that haunting uh, parable that our students need to reflect on, prayerfully on, that the one talent person uh, was not only lazy, he, I would say also, if I may, lacked courage, was unwilling to be a risk taker, uh, but he was condemned by the master who returned from that faraway country, not only as being lazy, but as being wicked. It was a pretty sharp condemnation. And so the failure to use one's, one's gifts then is a very important sort of starting out point of thinking theologically. Now, many of us uh, have been now in sessions, and I have some notes taken from some of the sessions, about what is distinctive uh, in a more practical sense about Christian higher education, what, what sets us apart. And, and, and the good news is that there is this sense, and I think we'll hear it from Tony Cronman this evening, that something very valuable has been lost uh, in the, the secular institutions. You're familiar with that entire now decade plus long body of literature with respect to something's missing in the secular experience. And it's a, it is, it's a lamentation. And Tony's answer is not Christian education, but it is, you know, let's, let's return to the idea of, of educating for wisdom. So we will hear what he has to say, but you know his book, Education's End, very philosophical, and then how is it that we can kind of restore uh, the uh, traditional vision of, of what education is, is about, a very ends-oriented, uh, uh, the kind of person that we're educating someone to be. And in one of uh, the sessions yesterday, our own Professor Doug uh, Henry uh, made some comments that, that I think deserve echoing, that modern humanism, uh, the dominant theme uh, in secular uh, institutions, uh, falls to a sort of twin pitfalls of pride on the one hand and despair on the other. C.S. Lewis, of course, identifies uh, pride as perhaps the most dangerous uh, sin if one is willing to engage in uh, categorization or hierarchical uh, review of different sins. But in the uh, life of the mind, that pride sometimes gives us answers that come too easily. Uh, this, again, is Professor Henry from Baylor. Uh, despair, on the other hand, provides no answers at all. 
we just throw up our hands. Uh, Christian scholarship, in contrast, allows us to, I think, strike a, a true course. Maybe it's even a balance, but perhaps that's the wrong way, wrong way of conceptualizing it, but a way of, of, of trying to find true north and the humility uh, that Doug spoke of yesterday, that we come from dust and to dust we shall return. But in the meantime, we have been created by this higher power and the image of this higher power with a phenomenal gift that our scientists are truly beginning to understand over this last generation. There's extraordinary horsepower. Uh, there's a fabulous, unfortunately he's not a believer, uh, leading uh, uh, scientist uh, at the Baylor College of Medicine who began his presentation recently in the following way, David Eagleman, you read him in New Yorker, he's a very, very prolific guy. And he said, the most complex phenomenon that we have discovered in the universe is the human brain. Now think of that, what a gift <laughs> we have been giving and therefore to be blessed to live the life uh, of uh, the mind. And so I want to reflect briefly on some wisdom. We need mentors, and I love Phil's call for us to be much more intentional with respect to mentoring. Well, uh, happily, during my uh, inaugural uh, year, uh, we had a series of mentors for our community come in. And the first mentor was Ken Elzinga. Many of you know him, renowned economist at the University of Virginia. Uh, and a deeply committed evangelical Christian wins all the teaching awards at the University of Virginia. Every time Ken is eligible, he receives, you're the best teacher. They, they sign up. Uh, they, it's, it's, it's a Baskin Robbins, take a number to try to get into his, his courses. And he said when he was here, and I'm quoting, when I teach economic theory of income distribution at the University of Virginia, remember Mr. Jefferson's university, it is not fair game for me to ask what uh, the insights are to be gained from the biblical principle of gleaning. I can't do that. I can't inquire about what that might teach us about the distribution of income in an industrialized society. One can have this kind of conversation in a Christian university. Let's call it integration of the academic enterprise with Christian faith. He also said, in addition to teaching, that we need to be extremely mindful in Christian higher education, this is instrumentalist, of credentialing. We need to make sure we're credentialing. And I think he really had in mind, of course, our graduate students. Make sure you're very intentional about credentialing them. What was left unsaid is it's a cold and chilly world out there, and so you need to make sure that you are giving the garments and the cloaks that are needed for your PhDs who go forward. But then the principle, this is such a wonderful congruity with what Phil lifted up. He lifted up mentoring, and he even does that at a large public university. I've met any number of people who've been mentored by Ken Elzinga. I mean, it's possible even in secular education for Christians, committed Christians, to become great mentors. And so I think the unifying dimension is to and where I began, the thinking theologically that we are, in fact, given gifts and we're given limited time and so forth. And so what do we do here at, at Baylor, among other things, and this is a woefully inadequate uh, categorization, but uh, as the, the song from The Sound of Music uh, put it, uh, let's begin at the very good beginning, a very good place to start. And one of the places where we start is in summer of the freshman year. Welcome to what we call line camp. Every school has its traditions, and we have this great metaphor of the Baylor line that began in 1845, and for Texas that was a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> um, and we invite the freshmen to participate in something called line camp. And so they're here for a short week. And we begin in that process of conversation, call it mentoring with you know, about a ratio of 10 students, incoming students to one, to begin thinking theologically and to put the parable of the talents and to start thinking 
as, as, as a good Lutheran would. Be thinking about vocation, life as vocation. Life is a calling, you've been given gifts. And so there's this marvelous scene when we put everybody in buses and we go to Independence. For those of you not from the great state of Texas, it all began in Washington on the, you think it began at the Alamo and I'm from San Antonio, but anyway, it began at Washington on the Brazos in a nearby little community called Independence. And that's where Baylor University began. And what remains of the original campus from the mid uh, 19th century are these iconic four columns that are replicated all over, every entrance is one of those four columns. That's what remains on Academy Hill and in Independence. And so the students in Lion Camp literally have a devotional service when they're called upon as the sun is setting in August. It does set even in Texas in August. And they're called upon during this time of reflection. It's a devotional and we ask you to prayerfully think about what are your gifts? What have you been given? What are you being called? You're beginning that process of thinking prayerfully about what you've been called to do. Now, many, of course, think that I'm going to be a doctor, or I'm going to be this, or I'm going to be that. But be prayerfully thankful. And then they literally march through the columns. And they're given a line jersey, which they put on. And the weeping of joy is just, we all start crying, because the students start crying, and then we start crying. It's just very infectious. And so we begin at the very beginning, and then we try to saturate the campus experience with scripture. I completely agree with what Phil has said. Call it three generations of biblical illiterates in the United States. And even those who grow up in Christian households and go to Sunday school or some form of formal religious instruction are woefully uh, underqualified and underinformed about scripture. And then a curriculum. What is the curriculum? And so we're very proud. One of our distinctives is Baylor, and we say, not only do we not apologize, but we're thankful that we have a very rigorous curriculum. You don't get to choose a whole lot uh, in those first couple of years, and you've got to take Christian scriptures, which is Bible, and you've got to take church history, which we call Christian heritage, and it's the two millennia of Christian heritage. We don't just begin with the Baptist experience, as important as that is for genera 400 years ago. We began at the very beginning. And then another thing that Baylor does is, and I think we do this well, you can always improve, and that is encouraging global missions. This is an incredibly mission-centric student body. We have over 2,000 of our students who have expressed in writing a vocational interest in ministry. That's, I, I want to be a youth pastor or whatever. Now that, that's, that's a pretty substantial out of 12,000. That, that's, that's a lot of students. But even more, even those who say, you know, I know one-third of our students are pre-med. Now, after they take organic chemistry, they, they go to law school. <laughs> Boy, isn't that true? Yeah, no, well, it, it's humbling. It's very, very, very humbling. And so what do we do? I could elaborate, but my time is expiring, and we want to hear from Father Spitzer. So what is it that the administrators or servant leaders uh, can do? And so I lift up uh, two uh, uh, images. Uh, one, and there's a great book called Joy at Work by my friend Dennis uh, Bakke. And Dennis, who's a great evangelical Christian, who's had the ups and downs, he was a billionaire, he's no longer a billionaire, thanks to Wall Street and so forth. But anyway, he's really a wonderful, joy at work. Isn't that great? It's, you know, straight out of Philippians, joy. How many times is the word joy or joyful in the book uh, to the church, the letter to the, those four chapters, 14 times? It's joy and joyful, you know, and it's a prison letter. That really is humbling, isn't it? So how do we create this joyful experience and that, I think, is something that we have to be continually focusing on as administrators, as servant leaders. Are we making this, doing everything we can to make this a joyful place and a joy-filled place and just exuberantly overflowing with joy? Uh, and, 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 and the other person, the person I would lift up is Barnabas, that it seems to me that we are to be sons and daughters of encouragement. But that's a role model for us. And so if you combine that within our Lord washing the disciples' feet, and so I'll close with what my friend Dennis keeps. He's now in a for-profit world again, and he's doing just fine. But what he keeps on his desk is a statue of our Lord washing the disciples' feet. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? And so at our wonderful Truett Theological Seminary, when we have our 
a convocation at the beginning. It's such a beautiful ceremony. Full academic, the medieval regalia. We're all marching in in the Paul Powell Chapel, and it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful ceremony. But our dean, David Garland, walks in not with some scepter representing the authority and the power, but he watch, comes in with a towel and a wash bowl. <laughs> And, and that's what I think we as educators, as administrators at a Christian university, should be continually carrying that washbowl and towel around. Well, I uh, likewise am deeply humbled to be not only amidst my two very esteemed colleagues, but uh, also humbled to be in all of your midst uh, to at least uh, give some thoughts that I have as both a Christian educator and a Christian administrator. Um, I want to thank Baylor for the opportunity to do this but also to thank all of you especially uh, my two esteemed colleagues for joining me in this effort. I think it's truly worthy of, of all of our psychic energy because it really is at the heart I think of everything we collectively believe. I thought I'd begin with a what. What is it that I think is a Christian wisdom, which I at least as a Christian educator would want to impart to my students, and then talk about the difficulties of the how. I mean, there are some obvious parts of the how that we know are indispensable, like hiring. Um, and then also, what are the difficulties of doing that how? How do we do the how? Uh, to get that uh, Christian wisdom off the ground. But first, the, the what. W what would I like to see? Um, we've seen certainly a, a lot of talks and, um, th th that have expressed the ideal of wisdom as being able to live the fullest possible life the one that would leave an optimal legacy in the world, the one that would uh, allow us to make the most pos uh, positive contribution that we could, the one that would reflect upon our highest powers, our deepest powers, the ones that would enable us to do the most, the ones that would even have transcendent implications, nay, not transcendent implications, but transcendent reality right here and now things about the human spirit that truly reflect us, reflect our highest, our deepest potential, capacity, power, and to be able to use this to leave some kind of an optimally positive legacy in the world. This would, I think, be the goal of, of everyone, secular, Christian, that somehow wisdom has something to do with this. The best use of our freedom and that would be something noble, something worth pursuing. But, but as, uh, as a Christian advocate of wisdom, uh, I, I know that I, I want for something more. It, it is not enough to have discovered that somehow uh, the true and the good and the beautiful, that these reflect our highest powers and give us the abilities to, to leave an optimal positive legacy in the world. But that other transcendental that Plato gave us and that of course is taken and embraced by Augustine and an entire generation of Christian thinkers. It is the one, the true, the good, and the beautiful. It is the one of Plato which is the unity of all being in the Parmenides and in the Sophist. It is the one of Aristotle that is the first cause that comes out in the metaphysics and the physics. It becomes such a, an intellectual bulwark of the creator. It is this ability to see and to seek the one. And when seeing the one, the one not only as first cause, but the one who also is truth itself, and goodness itself, and beauty itself, and love itself. It is this first of the transcendentals, the one that unifies everything so that truth itself is goodness itself, and goodness itself is beauty itself, and love itself, that it turns out to be God. 
And as Augustine saw, well, if this one, this God exists, then that changes everything about wisdom. Because the optimal positive legacy cannot be for this world alone. The optimal positive legacy that we can give to our students and, and to the world and to the educational enterprise must always go beyond this world to an eternity that's in the one, to a transcendence that's in the one. And for Augustine then, there is this idea that Christian wisdom pursues not just the true and the good and the beautiful, the one, the true, the good, and the beautiful, the one who is creator, the one who is eternal, the one who is transcendent. But Augustine in Christian wisdom goes even further, and he is the, for me, uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, the, the Bible, who, which of course as we, uh, I'm moving toward the Bible, um, he is an archetype of how to get to the Bible uh, in, in at least a secular uh, kind of society for, 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 for me. Because what he recognized is that implanted within every human spirit is the transcendentals themselves, these, the one, the true, the good, and the beautiful, this desire for it, this awareness of it. And, and in, upon seeing it, that very important introduction to the entire confessions, which all of you well know, for thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. It's this expression which I think stands at the very basis of Christian wisdom, to know that we are made for none other than God, to be literally involved, embedded in, in, in divine goodness and, and truth and, and, and love and beauty. And it is this very thought that drives Augustine, right? He wants to get there so desperately and, and, and finally sees that he cannot do it for himself. I would love every student to have had that Augustinian experience, to see that they could only be satisfied by truth itself, goodness itself, beauty itself, being itself, the one itself, and then see that thought, you know, that, that my heart's desire, the very thing which will fulfill, the only thing which will fulfill me, uh, unless my heart be restless. I cannot get there by myself. And that they should all have the same mentoring experience spoke about by both of my colleagues. A St. Ambrose in their lives that comes along and says, Augustine, you can't do this by yourself. You'll need Emmanuel. You will need God with us. God will have to take you to the transcendent. Even though you desire it, even though you're aware of it, you aren't it. You cannot give yourself your own fulfillment. You need Emmanuel. You need God with us. That every student should come to this realization to have a mentor that could lead them to that I need God to be with me, to accept the invitation, to see it in Jesus Christ, and to exclaim, late, late have I loved thee, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved thee. If that could be the experience of our students, it be an optimal, optimal experience of wisdom that would lead them surely to Scripture, surely to the New Testament, surely thirsting, as my two colleagues have said, for more and more and more of the one, the Emmanuel, who could bring us to our destiny, not just our fulfillment, but the optimal positive legacy, the well-lived life in wisdom. That that's what I would want from my students. But how? As I said before, I do think the how is in hiring. I think that the mentors, which my two esteemed colleagues have talked about, is in the hiring. I think that people who are going to impart this kind of wisdom upon our students, they have to be people not just with some mental conviction or great learning 
or great study of Augustine or great scholarly ability or even of high IQ an ability to synthesize even the humanities and the sciences I think we really need colleagues that have burning hearts convinced hearts something that they themselves have experienced and they want to impart to their students because it is so important it is so uh, as it were in intrinsically fundamental and yet the fulfillment of the call of being made in the image of God knowing that expression for thou hast made us for thyself and our our hearts are restless until they rest in thee it be colleagues like that which I think we need to, to hire and of course I'm not telling you anything new most of you who are like me are exactly where you are because of teachers that preceded you great professors who really did believe who had had that experience of Augustine and were able to lead you to it you had great probably lecture type teachers uh, when I sat there and listened to Joseph Pieper my head would be so full I couldn't I got it. I had to get out of that classroom and take another three hours of notes just to get it out of me because he, he, but he never engaged us really he, he lectured and yet my head was full <laughs> and, and, and of course there were other teachers who engaged me they were just the Jim Shaws of the father Jim Shaws of this world who just brought you around you know and they never you know really gave a lecture ever I mean they just kind of pulled it out of you in complete Socratic perfection but the, the, the one common thing that they all had was their they believed in their hearts that they, they, they loved in their hearts this wisdom this vision of wisdom and, and that's what I would want for my students to hire teachers professors just like that, the ones that made me to be who I am. But how? Uh, I come from a tradition, Georgetown and Seattle U and Gonzaga, where faculty governance is very important, um, uh, exceedingly so. A and of course, in, in the midst of that, I have to fairly say that not all of my faculty colleagues agree with my view of Christian wisdom agree that this is what would be good for the students um, and so how would I bring in then people who had this view this heart this conviction this ability to convey to students to the students that I, I, I would just love to have them hear these these great professors how, how can we do this I have just one proposal and I'll leave it uh, for the discussion I, I just think it is exceedingly difficult in places like Georgetown Gonzaga Seattle U good as they are and well intentioned as they are in their mission to do this university wide it, it, it because there just is going to be I think a lot of resistance and and a lot of time wasted trying to do it on a scale that um, you know maybe is a bridge too far so my one thought is I am not despairing of the possibility though is to bring in um, what I call core clusters and I have tried to do this wherever I have been at Georgetown at Seattle U we started a very successful core cluster uh, called faith in the great ideas which I think is still the most popular core cluster on campus and and basically a core cluster is that for the first two years of the core requirement uh, you can basically select a theme and the theme of uh, for me w could be Christian wisdom it could be faith in the great ideas however we would call it but essentially all we had to do in order to start a core cluster and this was supported by the faculty as a whole was to find like-minded colleagues who wanted to do this to come together to form a synergy and then of course to build I think this is possible right now in just about any kind of institution even those that are what I would call very pluralized but I think we need champions in both the faculty and the administration in order to do it 
people who will take it up and say, okay, let's propose a core cluster, let's see if this thing will work, and uh, then, of course, allow the core cluster to grow. What we found at both Georgetown and at Seattle U was that the core clusters did grow. In other words, they became very popular among the students. And this, in turn, creates the bold part of my proposal. And the bold part of the proposal is that then you have to hire to that because that's hiring for mission. But it's a very different kind of hiring. To hire to a core cluster versus hiring to a department is a very different kind of proposal. I think it will require a great deal of courage on the part of administrators and trustees and faculty members, though to break with the tradition of just simply hiring two departments. We need somebody in 18th century philosophy. We need someone in analytic, blah, blah, blah. We have to kind of move away from that as Christian educators, in my view, and set up a proposal where if we have significant enough core clusters with 200, 300, 400 freshmen participating in these core clusters, they deserve to be hired to. They deserve tenure track positions to be given to them. They deserve some kind of an endowment where professors can be endowed, really excellent professors, the kind that brought you and me around, can really come into the fore and to do this. And so I guess my proposal is just this in the second part of the how. It's first to form core clusters like faith and the great ideas or Christian wisdom or whatever we want to call it. But essentially to take maybe six to eight of those core courses in the freshman and sophomore year, at least six to eight, and try and put them together in some kind of synergy that has the points of the what that I gave at the first part of the talk. And then secondly, if those core clusters grow to student levels of 300 or more, that we ask and justifiably ask of our administrators and trustees for the sake of the mission that we be able to hire to the core cluster and not simply to the department, that we create a new way of doing things in Christian institutions which will allow us to give the very, very best to make our students' hearts burn in this unity of faith and reason, this unity of ratio and intellectus, this unity of our biblical and our transcendent and our whole uh, uh, scientific and humanistic worldview. I think this is one possible strategy, but I await your comments. Thank you very much. Well, before taking questions from you all, just want to give the three of you uh, a, a brief moment to offer a uh, comment on anything that the three of you have said, if you'd like to do that for just a couple of minutes. Yeah, just very briefly, um, thank you for both of those uh, presentations. It, it occurs to me, uh, Judge Starr, you were, you were talking about the um, the sense that education is at an end and the way that people are writing about the decline in the humanities and also a sense that, that we've lost a sense of value um, in, in university education. To me, it, it seems like a great time to make the case for Christ-centered education and, and just a huge opportunity for us uh, and the leadership of our institutions to make that case uh, because there is a sense of there must be more to education uh, than this. And then just a, a quick comment on, on Father Spitzer's um, Augustinian vision of education, which my, my heart thrills to your, your comments about that. Occurs to me just to add one, one element. You were talking about uh, the eternal dimension of this relationship with Christ, which is uh, eternal partly because Christ himself is eternal and also because in relationship with him, we ourselves have an eternal destiny. But in addition to that, I guess it's not really a but, but it's an and, um, I think that also means that our 
educational experience in the humanities and also in the sciences gives us intimations of eternity. We are already participating in eternal things as we pursue the true, the good, the beautiful. Uh, to me, it, it's, it's, not, it's not only what is in store for us in terms of our destiny, but also the way that that destiny enriches, enriches and enlivens our, our present experience. I, there's a line in, uh, in Marilyn uh, Robinson's Gilead that I, I love. It's just very evocative for me. One of her characters says, I believe that in the next life, this life will be Troy, and all that passes here will be the ballad that they sing in the streets. Uh, it's a way of saying that already we are participating in, in the life and worship and intellectual pursuit uh, of the life to come. So all of that just by way of affirmation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I'm also reminded of a quote from Alan Guth, uh, who is a very, very famous physicist, a, a kind of father of inflationary theory and Big Bang cosmology, and he's a uh, um, he's at MIT there, and he, he uh, kind of discovered this proof, really. It's a space-time geometry proof where you know, all inflationary model universes have to have a beginning. And even the pre-universes that might exist, like oscillating universes and multiverses, they'd have to have a beginning, too. And he finishes this proof, and he goes, hmm, imagine my surprise. At the end of all of this, it looks to be some transcendent cause out there. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. And, and of course, as you know, Stephen Hawking's been kind of very much trying to resist that conclusion for a little while. So, but uh, to no avail. <laughs> Inspired by the conversation, I want to, uh, to sound at least two chairs and maybe even three chairs for a university-wide uh, uh, effort. Uh, both with respect to intentionality of, of, of hiring, and I appreciate the, the difficulties uh, and challenges uh, that, that, uh, that that suggests. Uh, and that's a very large subject that perhaps we can talk about during the conversation. But just at a very practical uh, level, the uh, wonderful, the parable of the mustard seed, and how the leavening effect, not leveling, but the leavening effect of having a body like the Institute uh, faith uh, and learning. And so a brief autobiographical point, my own uh, experience uh, at Pepperdine, to be brought together in community, cutting across the silos. Uh, Daryl Tippins was quick to remind all of us that the uni in university means one. And so we would come together under the auspices uh, of the provost uh, and be in conversation together off campus, uh, not a typically a pretty nice uh, venue, a, a, a campus away from campus, and where we would have engaged in very prayerful, uh, serious reading for some days uh, in advance uh, of the program, and then some five days uh, together in fellowship and, and, and conversation. It, it, at a minimum, built a wonderful sense of community within the university, but given the nature and substance and richness of the readings required all of us, no matter how parochial our perspectives might be, especially those of us whose lives have been and minds have been narrowed by going to something like law school, that we can now <laughs> broaden our, our lenses and be in conversation together with people in the humanities, the sciences, as well as the professions coming together. And so if at your university, if you don't have an institute or center for faith and learning, uh, you should create one. But please only get advice from Darren Davis. He has a full-time job. Thank you very much. <laughs> this still <opens> to <laughs> Well, a uh, wonderful, wonderful poetry. conversation <laughs> begun. We invite your questions and comments. We have microphones here. Uh, and if you'll just come up and uh, tell us who you are and perhaps where you're from, uh, we invite your questions and your comments now. I'm Glenn Sanders from Oklahoma Baptist University, and uh, thank you so much for your inspiring words and the different um, uh, approaches you've suggested for embracing wisdom at the university level. Um, a simple but a hard question. If we want to maximize this effect for most of our students, 
how do we deal then with the high cost of higher education and the drag that that places upon these efforts? Uh, well, I will just take one stab at it. Um, I think in the end it will have to come down to uh, scholarships and endowments. It's my belief. Um, I, I, I don't see the cost of education somehow plummeting. Um, I don't see salaries really going down. I don't see scientific equipment becoming less expensive. I don't see facilities becoming less expensive. Um, it's just a part of what we're dealing with. Uh, I do think, though, that there is an enormous amount of generosity out there. I think um, as, as an administrator, the continual challenge for me was to take truly generous benefactors and ask them when they want to do a building and they want to do an athletic facility and they want to do bricks and mortar would you please consider an endowment for student scholarships or for academics and i think it really i mean i know my two esteemed colleagues know this is always somehow not the glamour thing but if we patiently work away at it that people do come around and they will truly contribute to this cause and as you've already suggested uh, we need to do it more and more and I think as administrators have to be absolutely assiduous you know at all times just kind of pushing our benefactors to this uh, endowment principle. At the founding of the American uh, Republic, uh, the dominant view was that it was entirely appropriate for the new government, the national government, the federal government, to be deeply engaged in the financing of education. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 was repassed, one of the earliest acts of the first Congress, and part of the Northwest Ordinance uh, sent money for education. Uh, and I love the opening words of Section 3 of the Northwest Ordinance. Religion, morality, and education being necessary to the, uh, to the happiness of mankind and to the means of good government. The means and good government, I'm sorry, I'm not getting exactly right. My memory is once again failing me. The means of education shall forever be encouraged. We have from time to time had wonderfully Washingtonian and Hamiltonian, call them, federalist acts like the GI Bill. What an empowering uh, mechanism that was. But that was the 20th century, and while General Washington never saw his dream realized of having a great national university, which he viewed as important for the progress of mankind, as well as, of course, that which was very much laid heavily on his heart, which was national unity, he never achieved that. But that was one of his great unrealized goals that I think has been largely lost in recent conversations about is higher education a public good or is it just a private good because you're going to make more money by virtue of having a college degree so you worry about it uh, yourself. So I think there needs to be a, a rediscovery of the venerable roots uh, of what it is that uh, an enlightened governmental policy is. But now we live in the age of uh, uh, budget cuts and, 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 and so forth. So, so what is to be done? I think it is presenting higher education with, a, in effect, not just a practical problem, but it's a, it's, it's a moral crisis. And we've got to now really reshape uh, the culture that uh, it is no longer uh, going to be the case that we look to federal and state government. Uh, that it has to now be a, a very communitarian, shared sense of responsibility, just as in ancient uh, Israel wandering around the Sinai Desert, everybody pitched in uh, to build uh, the, the simple tabernacle. Uh, that's the way we're going to have to finance, especially Christian uh, higher education. It is the moral duty of those who care about Christian higher education now to say, it's my responsibility and not simply that of the family whose child is going to benefit from Christian higher education.
I, I was persuaded by an article that appeared in uh, Chronicle of Higher Education within probably the last six months that higher education is a philanthropy. And um, when you view higher education as a consumer good, that brings a certain mentality to families and to students, but it also brings uh, a certain mentality to public life. And I think the astonishing skepticism that we now see about the value of higher education and the value of, and the cost of higher education is partly a, a failure to recognize that higher education is a philanthropy in the service of the coming generation, uh, not, a, not a consumer good. And uh, I'll just further say that the kind of wisdom that we're talking about in, in this panel discussion thrives in a residential community, Absolutely. which is a very costly kind of education to provide. And so those challenges, I, I think, are inescapable. Great. Gentlemen, um, thank you so much. Uh, Caleb Rosado at Warner Pacific College in Portland. Um, very impressed with the comments of all three of you. Uh, wisdom is definitely a rare commodity in today's society and becoming increasingly so. And building on what you have said, Professor the President Riken, with social media, it's even becoming less so. Uh, with all the technology that we have to bring into our universities in order to stay abreast of change and so forth. Um, you know, the whole soundbite culture is sort of taken over everything. The Twitter mentality, no more than 140 words and that's it. And that's the extent of our library of knowledge seems with this generation. As professors that have to deal in the classroom with all this technology, not only ourselves staying abreast, but also with students that even after you tell them not to connect, they still connect. And I go to the back of the room and they're still playing games on their computers. And obviously, the amount of wisdom they're getting out of those things <laughs> is for another job altogether whatsoever. So, and even Christians that commit themselves to be, you know, to honor and so forth, their very behavior in the classroom, it does not always reflect that. How, as presidents, how, as leaders, uh, how do we truly, in this uh, high-tech society, engage our students to, to have high touch with the divine? Which means sometimes we have to, as we said in the 60s, drop out and drop in, you know, <laughs> drop out of technology and drop into God. To, to, to rephrase it, how do we, in high tech, create this high relationship with God? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure I don't have the answer to that. These are great questions that we wrestle with as much as, as anyone does. Um, and particularly, you know, classroom management of this, I, I see on our campus a variety of different strategies um, in terms of what, what professors will or won't allow or, or encourage in a classroom. I, I think ultimately, um, efforts to police use of information technology will fail. Uh, what really needs to happen is a commitment from the heart to take full advantage of the educational opportunity that you have. Ultimately, that's a spiritual issue. I, I'm not sure of any you know, particular way, um, you know, one, one strategy for that. I will say, and this relates to um, comments Judge Starr was making about line camp, I think there's a critical um, critical role of the orientation process, whatever that looks like on a college campus, to enculturate students into the values of your community. A learning community has a, has a kind of ethos that, that either promotes certain things or hinders other things. And um, you really need a lot of buy-in to the values of that uh, community. The, the only practical suggestion I'll make is that it is very helpful for students to have some experiences of fasting from technology so that they see the kinds of uh, <laughs> relational dynamics that they're missing as they immerse themselves in a technology-rich environment. Um, you know, some campuses do that in an organized way. We do that in our Wheaton Passage program because we do not permit any information technology in that, you know, two-week experience, and we reflect on the role of technology. Now, that's not to say that students don't immediately, uh, you know, re-immerse themselves, but at least they have critical questions to ask themselves about their use of information technology. My simple observation is, is ours is a culture of freedom as manifested by the fact that just three months ago, 
the United States Supreme Court, by a supermajority, concluded that extraordinarily violent video games are protected by the free speech clause uh, of the Constitution because they're forms of expression. Uh, and to uh, seek to suppress those uh, is, in fact, inimical to the role of government. Now, we're talking about Christian higher education, so we have more freedom, thank goodness. But how do we uh, uh, respond to this in terms of academic freedom? The, the one example that I saw, and uh, Dr. Tippins can perhaps identify others in conversation, but, but at Pepperdine, one of our uh, professors at the School of Law, who also taught at the School of Public Policy, so he's very steeped not only in law, but economics, public policy, just had a, had a rule, thou shalt not. You, you just cannot. Now, I don't know what the enforcement mechanism was, but he spoke with such authority, and not as the scribes, uh, that apparently the students were obedient. Uh, another uh, device that was used was going ahead and just sort of monitoring, you know, just kind of good behavior, as it were. Uh, that is, you said you walk to the back of the classroom and guess what, they're playing video games and so forth. And so if the rule of civility, the rule of engagement is, please, we want you in this conversation and we want you fully mentally in the conversation. So please, I ask you as gentle persons to please, uh, uh, now, set all this uh, aside, and so encouragement and so forth. And I gather that there was some success, at least on the part of one professor with that. But when we put it to a vote, the fact is, shall we, in fact, uh, enter into a regime of thou shalt not call it censorship, the vote was overwhelmingly absolutely not. I just do not want to be part of that. Because I think the culture of freedom is so deeply embedded in our psyche that we worry about the specter of censorship. So encouragement, but I must say, Darryl, Peter Wendell made it work. He's a censor and he made it work and he won teaching awards. Um, well, I have a kind of another approach too that adds to the other uh, suggestions and that is if you can't beat them, sometimes uh, join them. <laughs> Um, and so I, I started a, a, a modjusreasonfaith.org website and basically put together an online encyclopedia of questions that students had indicated were important to them. You know, well, what is the evidence for God from physics? Or, you know, uh, why would an all-powerful, all-loving God allow suffering in the world, et cetera? And tried to put it into very good scholarly form that's it has lots of, you know, um, uh, footnotes and so forth, but put it onto Wikipedia software, right? So you can search it and do the things that kids like to do. You know, I want to go to this topic and see if I can get a hint for my research paper right now, you know, and so forth. So um, the website itself uh, was not getting um, all that many hits per day. Um, even with free videos, documentaries, until we uh, brought it on to the Facebook. We had a Facebook that was about 20,000 um, uh, friends, and then we started putting ch just, you know, a small chunk of the encyclopedia onto it, you know, as stimulus for questions and discussion. And it just says, for more, just go to the encyclopedia. And literally overnight, it, it, it basically increased at about 20 to 30 times, and that trend continues. So you can kind of uh, get their interest. You just have to do it very specifically, very focused. Facebook is a great vehicle, because they actually, their friends will recommend that you get on there and so forth and so on. And so there, there are some ways you can actually use technology to actually uh, stimulate their interest in genuine Christian wisdom. I'm Todd Ream from Indiana Wesleyan. Uh, if the oneness of God, as Father Spitzer argued, uh, is the basis for Christian wisdom, in what way or ways are our organizational structures sufficient and or insufficient? And in part, I'm thinking about disciplinary structures, which kind of started down this road by talking about centers and institutes, but also the structures that uh, harbor the curricular and the co-curricular and the relationships they share on campuses. 
should tackle that. <laughs> yeah, so in other words, how can we foster unity among all of the, our various programs? Is, 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 is that it? Or a decreased disunity? Oh. Especially given the current state of administrative structures. You know, we tend to have a division of labor model of sorts. Which yeah. my intuition is cuts against some of what you're arguing, what could be done, but I want to leave it open, you know, maybe yeah. there's some good. No, it's a really great question because we do have a division of labor model and even the way we reward scholarship is very division of labor model. Um, and so it does tend to separate us. We do tend to go into our own specializations um, and it does uh, tend to uh, lead away from, I think, integration, synthesis of learning, and certainly the kind of vision, I, you know, a core cluster where people actually uh, get together. Um, if I might be so bold, I'll make two suggestions. The first thing is, in any kind of a tenure decision, reward work that integrates and unifies. And I know, again, this is a bold suggestion because it's not commonly done. I mean, it just isn't. We split things up. You get this many points for research and that much for teaching. And it's, it's all divided. It's all a very divided. But I think it's worth faculty spending time figuring out ways of trying to put together a model where integration and unity especially around the Christian uh, mission, is rewarded uh, for tenure. The, the second uh, th thought I have, and again, I, I'm prepared for the torrent of objection, <laughs> but I think honestly that these kinds of pedagogical efforts and um, efforts to try and strengthen our Christian mission, there are all kinds of publications out there that will publish these things where there can be really great discussion among faculty members. The reason that our faculty won't publish there is because, again, they're not given very much research credit uh, for publishing in a pedagogical area, uh, in an educational area, instead of in a whatever, you know, physics of, you know, strings area, uh, of, you know, one of their specializations. So I guess the, the, I, I would put it right back to both administration and faculty. What will you reward uh, in your tenure process? And will you reward specifically integration and um, publication in these areas of Christian pedagogy and Christian wisdom? Yeah, I can't really answer the question, but I can mention a couple ways we're wrestling with it. I mean, part of what you're saying, Todd, is that the university is really a multiversity. And um, I, what I particularly, I see it from the student's perspective. Uh, you know, Wheaton, we've got a general education requirement. Uh, it's intended to be comprehensive and, and liberal arts orient, oriented, but it's really left to the student to figure out how all of these things relate to one another. And I, I think of the experience our faculty have, both in, new faculty in their year-long Integration of Faith and Learning seminar that's multidisciplinary in the sense that they, you've got faculty members from different disciplines working together, and then in our advanced seminars, um, as I've been in one of those advanced seminars this year, part of my question is how do we give our students this kind of learning experience where all of these pieces are coming together and you're seeing a whole in a way that you never could if you were just looking at it from one perspective. The areas, places where we're wrestling with that, two of them, one is as we review our general education requirement, we're asking the question, how can we help students understand how these things fit together? And, and I think one of the problems we have, and this is another area where we're wrestling with it, uh, faculty do not get enough incentive to teach multidisciplinary courses. Uh, because it's just as much work to team teach a course as it is, if not more, to do it by yourself. And we, at least at Wheaton, we don't give enough release time to really incentivize the kind of courses that faculty want to teach and that students want, actually want to learn from. So those are places where we're wrestling with the question. Perhaps this surely rules I'm with the Network for Vocation in Undergraduate Education. I think this is a follow-up question to the one just asked. And the responses so far have been that we want 
faculty to very much focus on the integration of knowledge across multiple disciplines, the integration of their teaching and scholarship in the Christian process. Here's the other question I have, and that is, if we want to talk about faculty as mentors, and mentoring of students involves the biggest question marks of their life about faith, where does faculty responsibility and role, or is there a faculty responsibility and, and role in their mentoring related to the very close personal faith formation of our students, a role which is sometimes given to campus ministry? Boy, I, I would just answer so affirmatively. I, I think the best teachers, the best mentors, I mean, you can, you know, go across the campus and just ask students, you know, who really had a significant impact on your life, you know, gave you that depth. It's generally faculty members who helped to share the depth of their experience, uh, especially on the level of faith. Sometimes it happens not on a level of faith. They just help uh, kids through, you know, uh, difficult experiences and things of that nature, take a personal interest in a student. But boy, when there is a sharing of wisdom, a deepening of their spirit, a whole different way of looking at life, some kind of a transformative element toward the transcendent, uh, I think these are the best teachers, and, and they're the ones that the students remember 30 years out. You know, this person affected me. You know, I mean, when I wrote my book, you know, New Proofs for the Existence of God from Physics and Philosophy, I dedicated it to the guy who I had as an undergraduate who took my question seriously because I just wanted to give some gift back for someone who actually gave me something. My, my dissertation mentor was Paul Weiss, and he had Alfred North Whitehead as his, uh, well, not only dissertation director, but as his freshman teacher. And he was so impressed with Whitehead, you know, after he had, you know, heard all these talks from him, that he, he basically typed up all of Whitehead's notes. And, and he, it was 2,000 pages, and, and he was a pauper at the time when he was at Harvard, and he gave them to, to Whitehead, and he said, here, this is for you. It's my gift back to you for what you have given me. You've given me the transcendent, you know, and Whitehead said, I can't possibly, I will pay you for these. He said, oh, God, you know, don't, I don't want payment. You've already paid me a thousand times over. The delightful end of the story is Mrs. Whitehead thought of a scheme, you know, where, you know, Whitehead comes into the classroom the next day and goes, okay, who's won the raffle for the, uh, for the new coat, you know, at the clothes store? Uh, it's Paul Weiss, you know, and of course, you know, Weiss, whoa, thank you so much, you know. About five years later, he figures out, you know, that <laughs> they paid him back. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Distraction. It's a charming story. Yeah. This has been an extraordinary conversation. Um, we are deeply grateful to you three for uh, sharing your time, very busy schedules, um, for the integrity that you have, for the thoughtfulness that you brought to this occasion, and, and for your devotion to Christian higher education. Please join me in thanking Dr. Riken, Father Spitzer, and Dr. Wonderful to be with us. Oh, you're